Now we come and we say Imam Ali is the first Imam and Imam Ali is worthy and qualified of being an Imam. Uh, which led people to believe and know that after Rasulullah Abu Bakr deserves to be Khalifa. Not only the Muslims, even the Kuffar were aware after Rasulullah the best man is Abu Bakr. Ali is a successor of the Prophet, the direct successor of the Prophet without any gap or interruption. That is a faith that every Muslim must have. We believe, and this is a, the difference between Sunnism and Shi'ism, we believe that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu was the person who was the most suitable to be the Khalifa. The events that unfolded around 1400 years ago are still debated today and continue to shape the Islamic world. This age-old debate revolves around a fundamental question after the Prophet's death. What actually happened versus what should have happened? The Sunni version, which describes what actually happened, revolves around a gathering at Saqifah after the Prophet's death, where prominent figures met to decide the Prophet's successor. They reached a consensus and chose Abu Bakr as the first caliph. This marked the beginning of the caliphate system based on merit and community consensus. The Shia version, which describes what should have happened, presents an alternative perspective on the events that followed the Prophet's demise. In the Shia tradition, it's believed that the Prophet Muhammad explicitly designated his cousin and son-in-law, Ali, as his successor at an event known as Ghadir Qam. This declaration, according to Shia belief, marked Imam Ali as the rightful leader of the Muslim community. Shia Islam places a strong emphasis on divine appointment and the principle of imamat, asserting that the leadership should have remained within the Prophet's family, continuing with the line of Imams, with Imam Ali as the first Imam. This perspective has been a significant point of contention and has shaped the distinctive beliefs and practices of Shia Muslims throughout history. Argument 1. The Shia perspective believes that Imam Ali was divinely appointed as the successor by the Prophet Muhammad at Ghadir Qum, making it a perpetual divine commandment for all time. According to the sources, the Prophet said, He of whom I am the master, of him Ali is also the master. However, an issue arises from the ambiguity surrounding the interpretation of the word Mala. Does Mala equate to a successor? Did it mean friend? Or was it just a praise for Ali? Regardless, for the sake of argument, let's assume that the Prophet did declare Ali as the divinely appointed successor as the Caliph. Again, a divine command from the Prophet is for all time that cannot be changed. It's crucial to understand that even Prophet Muhammad himself, when facing severe threats to his life, did not have the authority to modify or abandon the divine command of prophethood. Now, here lies a crucial point. If Ali's appointment at Ghadir Qum is viewed as a divine commandment, it should logically maintain the same eternal and unalterable status. However, a compelling counterpoint arises. It is documented that Ali eventually gave his allegiance to Abu Bakr. This act seemingly contradicts the divine command. Not only did it defy the divine commandment, but it also involved recognizing someone else as the successor. This historical event is discussed even by respected Shia scholars like Grand Ayatollah Taba Tabai, who notes in his book, and it has been mentioned that Ali gave his allegiance to Abu Bakr after six months. This action highlights a significant inconsistency within the Shia perspective. If we assume that Ghadir Qum was a divine command, then Imam Ali's allegiance to another leader goes against that very divine command, a total contradiction. To put it in perspective, Imagine if Prophet Muhammad abandoned his divine appointment and pledged allegiance to someone else as the Prophet. Argument 2. Another aspect that raises questions is the historical account that Ali couldn't even gather 40 followers to support his cause, which led him to remain silent. If this is indeed true, it begs the question, 
did nearly 99.99% of Muslims who had wholeheartedly embraced Islam, made significant sacrifices, and even risked their lives for their faith, suddenly decide to disobey the supposed divine command of the Prophet. Adding to the complexity is the sheer number of Muslims present at Ghadir Qum, supposedly around 100,000 followers. Yet practically all of them, if we follow the Shia perspective, decided to disregard the divine command of the Prophet. The problem deepens when we fast forward a few years. A significant majority of the Muslim masses eventually came to support Imam Ali as the fourth caliph. This poses yet another puzzle, if they had indeed disobeyed the Prophet's divine command. As the Shia perspective suggests, how do we make sense of this abrupt shift in their allegiance back to Imam Ali once again? In summary, it seems illogical that 99.99% .99 of early Muslims would defy the divine command and then, years later, rally behind Imam Ali as the successor. This inconsistency further strengthens the argument that Didir Qum may not have been a clear declaration of successorship. Simply put, if you lived during that time and attended Ghadir Qum, there is a 99.99% .99 chance you would not support Ali as the successor to the Prophet based on the Shia reference. Argument 3. Some argue that Ali was forced into allegiance. A grand ayatollah, Taba Tabai, noted that Ali, rather than being compelled, chose to isolate himself in his house for a period of time. During this period, a messenger was sent by Abu Bakr to request his allegiance. Imam Ali's response was noteworthy. He stated, I have promised not to leave my house except for the daily prayers until I compile the Quran. Eventually, after approximately six months, Ali gave his allegiance to Abu Bakr. The fact that Ali did not immediately pledge allegiance and instead opted to compile the Quran suggests that his decision was not forced but rather a deliberate choice on his part. This further raises questions about the argument that he was compelled into allegiance. It's also important to consider the timing at the time of this request, Abu Bakr had already been the caliph for several months and enjoyed the support of the majority. In such a scenario, it makes little sense to forcefully seek Imam Ali's allegiance, as it wouldn't change Abu Bakr's position as the caliph. Argument 4. Age played a significant role in the succession debate after the Prophet's passing. As the Shia references state, Followers of Abu Bakr considered age as a critical criterion at that time, while Ali was relatively young. The question we must ask is, why was age being considered in the first place? If there truly was a divine commandment from the Prophet to follow Ali as his successor, age should not have been a factor. This age criterion suggests that the divine commandment might not have been widely believed. Imam Ali's age was almost half that of Abu Bakr's at that time. Instead, the focus was on adhering to the norms and political conventions of the society of that time, where elders were often perceived as better candidates for leadership. In other words, the age argument implies that the majority did not believe the alleged divine commandment in favor of Ali as the successor. This calls into question the legitimacy of such a divine commandment as it appears to have been largely missing in favor of conventional political norms. Argument 5. Why wasn't the belief in Imam Ali's succession clearly mentioned in the Quran if it's such a fundamental aspect of Islam? The Quran indeed mentions some individuals by name, including the Prophet's family members and companions but it doesn't explicitly spell out the details of Imam Ali's succession. All it needed was three words, Ali is successor, especially considering that Imam Ali was alive during the period of Quranic revelation. The absence of fundamental core beliefs from the Quran, like Imam Ali's succession, is another argument put forward to question the notion of a direct divine appointment by the Prophet. Argument 6. 
Another point used against the notion of Ali's direct divine appointment as the successor is the absence of any clear reference where Imam Ali himself declared to the masses that he had been chosen by the Prophet for this role. Just imagine being present during that pivotal time in history. If this divine appointment was indeed a core aspect of the faith, wouldn't it make sense for Imam Ali to declare it openly to the masses? This absence of a direct proclamation by Imam Ali to the masses has led some to question the narrative of his divine appointment as the successor, as they argue that such a fundamental declaration should have been explicitly communicated to the Muslim community at the time. In conclusion, the debates of over 1400 years ago still stir controversy today, shaping diverse beliefs in the Islamic world. We've explored arguments challenging the Shia perspective on Imam Ali's direct divine appointment, backed by historical accounts, logic, and the absence of clear declarations. As we ponder these historical details, we must continue open dialogue and reasoned discussion to grasp the nuances of this enduring debate.